Welcome and thank you for joining us here today. My name is Kevin Bowling with the Secular Student Alliance. I'm very glad to have uh, David Ornstein joining us. He is a professor of anthropology at Medgar Evers College in New York. He has also co-authored two books. The most recent in 2019 was uh, Darwin's Apostle. Uh, David is also an ordained humanist chaplain and serves on the board of several local and national organizations, including those within the secular movements. So without further ado, we're very pleased to have uh, David uh, here you. with us tonight. Uh, uh, Kevin, I really appreciate the invitation uh, to come and speak at uh, this year's SSA Darwin event. You know, when I was an, a young anthropology student, um, I had uh, uh, always been a uh, uh, someone who was very curious, always a non-believer, um, certainly a secularist. And um, I only wish back in the Jurassic period when I was a college student that uh, there was an SSA uh, that I could have uh, joined with like-minded people who are committed to secular democracy, understanding the natural world, seeing the world as it is rather than the way we want it to be. And um, I really appreciate all of your work, all of the students and uh, everyone uh, connected to uh, SSA as well. Thank you, that means a lot. And I know you've had some good involvement with the SSA in the past and we appreciate all your work and clearly having faculty at campuses really makes a difference for our students. And besides that with your expertise as well. So we appreciate it also. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I can, uh, let me see now if I can uh, share my screen. And voila, we have uh, the PowerPoint ready. So um, uh, I'll just start by uh, noting a couple of things. Because I'm an anthropologist, I'm very uh, holistic in my approach to many things um, that as you know you, you sort of see things from multiple levels uh, and you see that the world and the issues at hand are as long as they are deep and so while we'll be focusing on Darwin as an apical free thought ancestor we can't not talk about Darwin and his life and all of his connections uh, without going into um, several issues related to not only his history, uh, but the history of natural selection uh, in general. And um, I'd like to start by first, of course, uh, oh, why, why can I not? I'm not sure why I can't. Um, move the PowerPoint. So there's a minor technical difficulty, it looks like. Hello? I'm, he I'm here. Yeah, I'm not sure why I here. Let me try it from down here, sorry. Yeah, there we go, okay. okay. My, my, my fault. Again, um, uh, as I was mentioning, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Luddite. I'm sure half the people viewing this were probably screaming at their screens and saying, go to the left bottom corner. So I appreciate all your help. Um, you know, before we start talking about Darwin, there's a lot of other things that are happening in February, uh, which uh, I think uh, deserve amount, uh, an amount of attention. Certainly this is Black History Month. Uh, on November, I'm sorry, on February 11th, it's also National Day of uh, Women and Girls in Science. And so uh, it's important, I think, that we remember that uh, the patriarchy uh, has had real problems with inclusion. Um, and through this lack of inclusion, the stories and the people who have given so much to science don't get their fair share of acknowledgement. Uh, I mean, we could certainly go back in time and think about Hypatia and Madame Curie and, you know, the, if you saw a hidden 
um, uh, hidden figures, you know, about Johnson and Vort, uh, Vaughn and Jackson and their help with NASA. We can't also forget uh, Jane Goodall and uh, Maeve Leakey and Penny Patterson of the Gorilla Foundation. So many women, so many people of brown and black skin or indigenous peoples who have made a commitment to uh, the world of science. And by um, while we're talking about Darwin, we have to really talk about um, everybody else. Uh, because quite literally, there are millions of people who have worked in all facets of sciences, including helping with the creation of the new coronavirus vaccines uh, that will essentially help move our, huma our common humanity forward. So um, I'm a big um, believer, um, uh, not in religion, uh, but in um, uh, Mr. Rogers. And there's something that Mr. Rogers always does, which is he, he calls attention to remembering those who have made a difference in your life and that you should take a few moments in your own time to, to remember them. So what I like to do is for everyone who is on uh, this uh, presentation tonight is to just take a moment, maybe we take 15 or 20 seconds, I'll time it. Uh, and remember the girls, a girl or a woman or girls and women or people of different uh, ethnic groups who because of their work in science, um, they loved you into being. They might have been a mentor for you or something like that. So let's just take 20 seconds and say thank you to the world which is not white Anglo-Saxon male. We'll do 20 seconds. Okay, so thank you. I hope uh, this was uh, satisfying. Uh, if you are a female and you're watching this, if you're uh, 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 gendered uh, in any way how you describe yourself, if you're black, brown, indigenous, know that you are wanted in science, that science belongs to you as it belongs to everybody else. But now we'll, we'll go forward. Um, so one of the things about uh, Darwin's work is that it is profound and has impacted uh, the world around us in hundreds, if not millions of different ways. In fact, in surveys that are done, when people say, what are the things that really make us human? It's the understanding of gravity, of DNA and RNA, the concept of zero in mathematics, Earth's place in the universe, um, and then there were these rather non-scientific um, uh, uh, surveys that were done. By the way, if you notice, evolution is usually one of the ones that is in the top few that are talked about as we know the world because of these things. And uh, a Time magazine did a study of the hundred people. And while this is more about likes and things like that, You'll notice that of the uh, top 100 people who've made a difference in the world, Charles Darwin comes in uh, based on their unscientific survey is number 12. Well, I unscientifically like to always take out the religious, the fascists, the slaveholders and the conquerors. And when you take that out, you see Darwin actually moves up like a bullet uh, to number four. So the impact of Charles Darwin, whether we see it in lay terms or we see it as uh, part of our understanding of science, is uh, really, really very deep. In fact, 50 years after um, Origin of a Species was published, it was published in 1859, you had people like John Dewey coming out and talking about uh, the importance of Darwin's work and how it impacted uh, education, how it created an intellectual revolution. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about humanists and uh, atheists and non-believers, but it changed the tenor of how we could talk about things because it gave us a, an avenue to look at 
deep time. Um, and you find that also that it wasn't just um, um, people like Dewey, but W.E.B. Du Bois, who uh, in, wrote in a, uh, 1909 in the evolution of the race problem, that what Darwin also did, and Huxley certainly points this out earlier, 50 years earlier, is that Darwin, through Origin of Species, created a sense of equity. That is, if we're all from a common human ancestor, well, you know, what gives someone the right to um, take another group's uh, land uh, or, um, uh, you know, uh, destroy a culture or language for the sake of their country? Uh, that is, why are we not sharing uh, the resources of this planet, um, both economically, politically, and socially, more evenly if we are all really brothers and sisters under the skin. So there's this acknowledgement just even 50 years after the work of Darwin, but even much earlier than that too. Um, if you think about natural selection, uh, it, it, it's not a modern theory. In fact, you can go back to the seventh century BCE where we have people who like a, a, a Samander who postulated that life rose from the sea. You have Aristotle and Plato talking about essentialism and the earliest idea of a great chain of being, that is things are related to each other biologically. Uh, the Chinese um, philosopher Zhang Zhu looking and saying that species change over time in the fourth century BCE. Now, you know, we're talking about adaptation and speciation here way before um, people actually even had words for it. And then if you look at the Islamic philosopher Nasir al-Din Tusi, you find that the writings there are incredibly modern in the sense that the author wrote 700 years before Darwin and Wallace wrote their papers coming up with the same idea of natural selection. Um, if you fast forward, you find that uh, leading up to um, uh, Darwin's work, you have Comte de Buffon, you have Linnaeus, Lamarck, Cuvier, even Erasmus's um, uh, grandfather, um, you know, who wrote that the earth was 70,000 years old. De Buffon did that as well. Before that, you had a literal inter interpretation uh, the, uh, of the Bible, which said that it's only 6,000 years old. In fact, we still have that with us today. We haven't gotten, we haven't grown past that adolescence in thinking. Um, and so you find that there's a precursor to the work of Darwin that these I, philosophers and um, practitioners of science who were deeply religious, of course, for the most part, and really saw religion and science as being uh, one central idea, um, uh, really helped move the world forward, even though there was so much more to see and to know and to get to know. And what Darwin's seminal work did in, in the origin of species was really moved um, us 150 years um, or 200 and 350 years into the future back in 1859. Uh, we also have to thank people like Alexander von Humboldt, who was an explorer in the generation before Darwin, who Darwin himself read of Humboldt's explorations uh, if you've ever heard of the Humboldt Current, that is this man. In fact, he was quite the humanist and intellectual who discarded religion for the natural world and was certainly foundational and supportive of Darwin's work. Uh, Humboldt, von Humboldt died in 1859, the year of the publication of The Origin of Species. Um, but he uh, was an admirer of Darwin as Darwin was of his and a supporter of Darwin as well. So here's some, if you ever 
want to go to your, if you want to search the internet uh, or go to your local library, you can look up Humble and all that he did as a naturalist, uh, which excited people in the 19th century to also go and, and explore and take things um, uh, back to their laboratories and understand them, which was really Darwin's um, sole interest in being. You know, Darwin um, was a student who started out as in medicine and um, couldn't stand the sight of blood. Um, so he did his fallback, uh, which was, what do you do when you're part of, you're not, he, he wasn't part of the aristocracy, but his family came from wealth. And so Darwin actually uh, got his degree in theology. <laughs> um, if you can believe that, if you didn't know that before, uh, not that he did much with it, uh, but that's really, you had a choice in uh, the 19th century, if you were a person of means, where you became, um, you know, a doctor, a physician, uh, a barrister, uh, or a clergyman. Those were the high-end jobs of the time. So natural selection really is several thousand years in the making. Although Darwin in his great synthesis and 20 years after his trip to the Galapagos, taking all of that research and all the research that, that came out of that um, uh, with his connections and correspondence with other naturalists from literally around the globe who would send species to Darwin um, and then Darwin would use those for his own research. You know, it, origin of species is pretty simple. Uh, that's the one of the wonderful things about it, which made it so um, special when it came out. Um, it basically points to three different things. You know, populations vary. Uh, offspring will look like their parents, but their differences uh, are historic and are related to the environment and uh, reproduction and survival. Very simple ideas. Um, and uh, so really what Darwin was saying is that, look, things change over time. Uh, traits that support survival are important for reproduction uh, will continue and species will adapt or speciate or go extinct within their environment. Very, very simple, uh, but earth shattering in the sense that uh, when it came out in 1859, the church and those who were connected to science and religion uh, really fought this idea. And this is one of the reasons why Darwin took 20 years to publish. So one thing that we should note uh, also uh, is that uh, Darwin um, never wrote about um, the idea of society as practiced under the same ideas of speciation, adaptation, and extinction. Um, Darwin was anti-slavery, although not anti-patriarchy. Uh, Darwin had a dim view of uh, women in science and their and women's intellectual robustness, uh, not really seeing it on par uh, with uh, uh, males. Uh, and it should be noted that sometimes great men get it wrong. You know, he was as much a a person of his time as he was a person of our time. Um, but Darwin's apostles were very sympathetic uh, to the social for forces. They were pro-labor, things were changing uh, very dramatically in the 19th century. Um, and if you grew up in the 19th century, um, you would not see the world so terribly different. It I don't think it would be as much a strange place where if you were 300 years ago or 500 years ago or 600 years ago and vice versa, if we went back to that time, although we wouldn't have the comforts of the internet and Facebook and Twitter and iPhones, we could understand that time very, very well. So why was Darwin's ideas rejected? Well, for several reasons. Some of them were religious, but some of them were simply spiritual. Uh, Victorian England and Queen Victoria was a spiritualist, especially after her husband died. There were tons of seances 
and belief in the occult and the idea that you can read palms and read leaves. And so if you are connected to the world of magic as the occult is, uh, there's a reluctance to accept the material universe as it is, um, especially if we think about things like death. Um, uh, um, and so Victorian England sort of rejected Darwin's work, not so much because they, there was so much religion involved, but because of the superstition and the occult that was involved. That doesn't mean there wasn't structural issues related to religion that um, um, fostered um, a suspicion of Darwin's work or outright hostility. You know, science and religion in, in even the great thinkers of the time, some of Darwin's own apostles, uh, Asa Gray, who was an incredible naturalist, who was an American, um, tried, sought to bring religion and evolution together. And while he accepted natural selection, you know, went to the idea of, well, first cause, which is we find today very much uh, the idea of, well, what started it all? Um, so science and religion up until Darwin's time was still very, very connected. Uh, the Church of England and um, the Vatican um, really uh, despised Darwin and his work and saw the writing on the wall. And as um, T.H. Huxley said that one of the things Darwin did when he wrote Origin of Species, and this is a quote from Huxley, is that he killed God. Because if we are all here and part of nature and we're all connected, then there's no place for God in this scheme of the world that relies on material rationalism um, for the world to exist. Um, and you found that the monarchy and social elites equally distrusted Darwin because again, if you're saying we're all equals underneath the skin and all of this stuff on the outside is just, well, adaptation, um, then the reality is, well, what gives you the right for both God and country to say, that country is mine. <laughs> uh, and so the monarchy and social elites really were suspicious of Darwin. Of course, Darwin didn't help himself in these matters very much. He was a deep thinker. Uh, he was a brilliant naturalist uh, and he was an excellent writer. Um, but um, he had severe issues related to shyness. He had real phobias and they came out as psychosomatic illness. Darwin spent a lot of his time in bed after and even before the Origin of Species was published because he knew how disruptive the ideas that he was bringing forward were going to be. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it even affected his whole life. You know, his wife was a believer. And the thing that upset his wife was that if Darwin was going down this road with his ideas, that there would clearly be a break. And she believed that they would not see each other in the afterlife. So this played on Darwin as well. Uh, certainly the loss of his daughter, Annie, when she was nine years old, haunted him. And that was one of the real breaks with him in terms of theology. I think he, uh, to the end of his days, never came out as an atheist, but certainly came out uh, in one of his last interviews, and we'll touch on that, uh, as an agnostic. Uh, and finally, again, he was not a public speaker. Um, he was a researcher and a collaborator, but never spoke on his own behalf. Um, Theodorus uh, Dob uh, Dobzhansky um, said it, it, that it, the, this is a Polish um, biologist who said that biology would not make sense except for the light of evolution. And uh, we know that to be true. Uh, Darwin knew it then, although Darwin, you have to remember, grew up at a time in the world where there were no scanning electron microscopes, right? So think about it, here he is, and Wallace as well. We have to give our um, platitude, our, uh, our thanks to, uh, to Alfred Russell Wallace as well, um, because he you know, is the co-discoverer of natural selection in its most modern form. Uh, so just as Darwin wrote in his, um, 
uh, journals in the eight, uh, 1830s and 1840s, the seminal idea that species change over time, uh, we see that uh, in the tree of life. Again, this is Darwin writing, taking the idea of the great chain of being, removing the gods and the archangels, looking at things through the idea of adaptation and speciation and extinction, and really moving the idea that we are all um, a part of nature. Uh, we see that in the tree of life. Um, we see this with all the many phylums. We see this in the idea and the philosophies connecting Darwin to Draper and Wallace, to Neil deGrasse Tyson, to Carl Sagan, um, to uh, you know hundreds of intellectuals across all fields of knowledge, whether it be the physical sciences, the social sciences. Uh, the root for many of them, they will say, certainly was Darwin's seminal work. Um, in both the origin of species and eventually later in the descent of man. Uh, and you see that uh, come out in all of the disciplines that are affected by natural selection, not just anthropology, but even religious studies. Uh, we talked about Dewey earlier in education, but you will find writings in all of these areas that either rely on Darwin's work uh, or have some um, connection to the idea of natural selection in how the operations of these disciplines work. So what did Darwin do? He liberated us from the inadequacies of a theologically centered view of the com cosmos. He removed that from the necessary, the need to have to believe in the divine. If you choose to believe in the vine, that's you know uh, your choice. But Darwin rethought the world without a theological or divine center, and so that liberation is very important. He also simultaneously showed that if we are humanistic in our views, that patriarchy and imperialism are evils that are justified on race theory, which if you read Darwin's work, who is so anti-slavery, you realize that both the cure for human suffering and the solace does not have to come from anything other than the ethics of goodness that humanism can provide. So we have a tale of two June 30ths. Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859, uh, November of 1859. In 1858, he and Alfred Russell Wallace co-authored uh, um, what, what would become the opening salvo at the Linnaean Society of the um, uh, examples of natural selection. And it was then a year later that Origin of Species was published. Um, and then a year later still was the, um, uh, what I like to call the, the, well, which is known as the Huxley-Wilberforce uh, debate in which it was clear that not only Huxley who argued for Darwin's behalf, um, but also um, uh, uh, Joseph Hooker, who was one of Darwin's oldest friends and who was the chief botanist um, at the Royal Kew Gardens, and uh, um, uh, Draper uh, also uh, spoke in Darwin's defense, two of Darwin's apostles in the book. Um, these were, of course, the people who, who really are focused on um, the book, uh, Darwin's apostle, and how they actually worked both as spokespeople for Darwin writing uh, individual op-eds op in favor of Darwin, speaking out on Darwin's behalf because Darwin was incapable of doing so. So men like Joseph Hooker, T.H. Huxley, John William Draper, Asa Gray, Alfred Russell Wallace, had they not in 1859 and 1860 and then going forward, really up for the next 30 years, been advocates for, Dra uh, for Darwin's work who knows what would have happened to Darwin's work 
it could have been sidelined because there were so many people in the um, um, in, in both the scientific community and the aristocracy who would have loved to see Darwin's work die on the vine. Um, these men and many others, uh, men and women, uh, saw that it didn't happen. But these uh, five gentlemen were certainly um, advocates for Darwin's work. And at the time of Darwin's work in 1859, you have a lot of things that were happening. You have the suffrage movement in both the United States uh, and in, um, in, in, and in England, you have labor uh, reforms, prison reforms, the idea of children uh, getting education, uh, getting educated, healthcare reform, all these things that we're still sort of tinkering with because we know they're not working to the best, had their own, if you'll pardon the word, genesis in terms of the modern world in the 1850s, in the 1860s, in the 1880s, along with the stupendous work of Charles Darwin, who really did help move these ideas forward, both as standalone, but also in support of uh, these ideas. Even if Darwin didn't accept some of them themselves, they drew on Darwin's work. And so you have people like Marx who really saw, um, uh, who loved Darwin's work. He might not have accepted all the aspects of it, um, but uh, he referred to Darwin um, as a great mind and a great thinker. In fact, uh, Marx sent a copy of Das Kapital to Darwin, inscribing it um, with, the, with the words of, uh, you know, you're my good friend. Um, um, then you have other people who were definitely on the left who are either communists or socialists who also um, spoke um, out in writings after reading The Origin of Species um, saying that basically evolution shows that nature um, uh, levels the playing field. Um, you have other people who were scientists and people who are on the left um, who wrote, uh, including uh, Peter Propopkin uh, later on, um, who wrote that Darwin's work uh, really showed that there were greater implications for the world in terms of social theory, um, fairness, humanness, hu uh, humanism. Um, and so these are, these are just some of the people who Darwin's lives uh, whose lives were touched by Darwin, and they were great thinkers of themselves. Um, the, the purpose of this talk is to really look at the growing 19th century movement of the free thought, and so now we finally get here after all this uh, pre-stuff uh, that went on, and uh, we'll talk in a more detail about some of the great thinkers, the free thinkers of the 19th century. Uh, you know, people like Robert Ingersoll, who was known as the great agnostic, who uh, really was the rock star, I always say that, of American free thought in the 19th century. Newspapers would follow this man um, from town to town. Um, there were no blogs at the time, so they would put out these little penny or pence, uh, well, in America, it was probably like two cents, uh, rather than Pence, um, um, little little pamphlets of his speeches. And, uh, you know, he was, a, Susan Jacoby wrote a wonderful book about him calling him the great agnostic, and he clearly was, and he really fought for the ideas of humanism, the same things that Felix Adler was doing for the Ethical Society, uh, Ingersoll was doing for um, uh, for humanism and a world without the need for theology. Um, some of the things that he said was that this century is Darwin's century and that his work affected the globe um, and that um, uh, Darwin's work in one volume said more than any religious teacher. Um, another quote from Ingersoll was about the church uh, and teaching um, ignorance, if you will. 
the idea of um, these um, fantasies of, uh, you know, uh, life with talking snakes and all this other stuff really not being uh, anything more than mythology. And we owe Darwin a cha our thanks because when you replace mythology with facts, you get truth. And Darwin was a truth seeker. Um, again, this is Ingersoll writing in Ingersoll the Magnificent. Uh, which is a book about him that Darwin, you know, Darwin basically destroyed the foundation of Orthodox Christianity. Um, he took away the need to have fear and the need to have faith and for us to be able to clearly investigate the, the natural world using our reason and the tools of science. Uh, finally, um, here's another um, a uh, quote where uh, Ingersoll relies on Spencer and Draper, who's one of the um, uh, people who uh, supported Darwin. Uh, Humboldt is mentioned, of course, and how the, the, the science, the world of science can explain much more in moments than a doctrine in theology can present in decades of religious study. Uh, the next person is D.M. Bennett, uh, who was a very important person. He was the first publisher of something called The Truth Seeker, which is still in publication today. It was a atheist humanist uh, newspaper that came out and started uh, in the mid 1800s. Um, he, would, uh, he would go on to serialize, that is publish portions of the entire book of the descent of man in this work, uh, in The Truth Seeker. Um, it was in The Truth Seeker that when Darwin's body was moved from its first resting place after he died in 1882 to uh, Westminster Abbey, that it was the truth seeker who said, hold on guys, now you're embracing him you know, when in his life you treated him uh, uh, with disrespect. Um, so you find that uh, the truth seeker um, was very, very important to the early humanist free thinker movement because it was the publication to go to. It was before the internet and you needed to get this magazine if you wanted to fill out your mind. Uh, the Truth Seeker would also publish pro-Darwin articles um, and stuff about origin of species uh, during the Scopes Monkey Trial. So here are some excerpts. Uh, here's Aveling uh, in his discussion with uh, Darwin, who here in one of his last interviews said he would not really necessarily consider himself an atheist, but a, as an agnostic, uh, but that at the end of his life and actually earlier than the end of his life, uh, would sort of give up on Christianity as a moral philosophy, a way of seeing and explaining the world and the fear that comes with what happens after we die. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, who's of course known for the uh, suffrage movement, uh, relied on Dar Darwin's work as well. Um, and showed that if uh, species are the same, then what gives man the right, uh, that is uh, man with a capital M, you know, or small m, you know, men rather than man, uh, the right to um, say women can't vote or don't have a right to reproductive freedom or shouldn't be allowed to have jobs, you know, and she took from Darwin's work the essential idea that equality comes from understanding that we are all coming from the design of nature. And here are some uh, two quotes uh, concerning her uh, ideas about the moral law and the material world uh, and how we can in human relations uh, be fair to each other when we treat each other as equals. Uh, here's another one which he actually published very close right before her, almost her death, uh, where she takes on to the idea that the Bible degrades women 
uh, in many passages and uh, um, uh, we should uh, avoid it at all costs. Uh, Andrew Dixon White uh, is a very important for free thinker during the Civil War. Um, he actually uh, went abroad and made sure that England and France did not ass uh, assist the breakaway states um, uh, during, during the American Civil War. He's the founder of, one of the founders of Cornell uh, University, which during the timing of uh, Cornell, a lot of other universities were being um, uh, founded that were religious based. And he demanded that Cornell be a secular institution and remain so. So, you know, people who eventually went there like Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson and all these people uh, who sought out Cornell owe their thanks for, in a sense, for Cornell to have this majesty of being this br hub of brilliance, secular brilliance, because of men like A.D. White, who was a humanist um, and really fought for um, um, uh, the idea of truth in, in humanity. He also wrote this incredible treatise on uh, the conflicts between women, uh, between religion and science, uh, which sort of mirrored the uh, work of um, Draper, who 50 years earlier published a similar uh, set of volumes on the same subject. And here are some things that he wrote on the history of warfare of science and Christendom in all opposition had been availing nothing. Darwin's work. Uh, uh, was secure um, and that he, you know, his great labors, even though they, he was attacked, uh, that all of these attacks came to nothing because he led an honest, kindly, and tolerant life. Uh, Charles Bradlaugh, now we're skipping from American free thought to British free thought, uh, was the publisher um, of uh, uh, the National Reformer which was a uh, humanist paper uh, from Britain's National Secular Society. Um, he and Annie Besant would go on to stand trial for publishing, uh, republishing a pamphlet on um, uh, female contraception. Um, uh, this man, uh, Charles Bradlaugh, uh, uh, did not did not want to take uh, his oath when he was uh, going into parliament um, on, a, on a Bible um, and he was imprisoned for his ideas. Uh, the idea that people can be imprisoned for not wanting to put their hands on a Bible seemed very, very scary. And this person not, not only rejected the idea uh, but kept to his ideas and made sure that um, it, it was known to those who followed him that he would go to jail for his beliefs, and he did. Um, so he's a very good guy. Um, this is um, one of the things, he was not only a publisher of this newspaper, but of um, uh, several other papers, and in Cockbill's Darwin's uh, Aesthetic, uh, this came out in and uh, it's uh, very important to read. Hopefully you'll go, be able to go back. I, for the lack of time, I don't wanna go over all of these, uh, but I'll leave them up on the screen for a moment or two while I talk. So you can see how in the 19th century and into the 20th century, these people uh, who are quoting Darwin or understanding Darwin's importance are taking his ideas and moving them around and for what would become the 19th and 20th century free thought, civil rights movement even. Here's another quote from uh, the athe uh, atheistic platform from Brad Law that again lauds Darwin for uh, his work um, and uh, respects Darwin very much. Here's another. And again, the idea of, of the theme that, you know, um, Darwin took the heat uh, that uh, Wallace never had to 
um, feel uh, because uh, natural selection when it came when it was published, uh, it was Darwin who was um, ridiculed uh, almost violently. Um, uh, and you see it today in our world, that same idea of ridiculing Darwin's work. Um, uh, so the, the issues have not changed in the last 150 years. The names may have changed, but the idea of concepts like intelligent design, irreducible complexity, um, uh, uh, faith-based understanding, teaching, the idea of teaching uh, um, uh, creationism alongside with natural selection is, as being equals. Uh, you see this over and over again, not only in the 19th century, but through the 20th and even the 21st century. Uh, Annie Besant, again, um, um, who was a, an intellectual, um, sort uh, used Darwin's work uh, to propel the um, suffrage movement uh, in uh, the UK um, during her lifetime as well. Here are just some quotes. And then we go to the, if, if, um, if some of these people were apostles, then the next generation, people who lived well into the 20th century or part of the 20th century, like George Foote, who was um, uh, an atheist and a humanist, uh, would go on to write books lauding Darwin and was a protege of Bradlaugh um, and a, a, a pub, the, the next pub, the publisher uh, of Bradlaugh's paper uh, had deep admiration for Darwin um, and uh, compared, even compared Darwin's work as so fun fundamentally important as to match it up with, um, with Newton. Um, here are certain things that, Dar that Foot wrote. Darwin's work is remarkable, it's profound, and it changes the human, uh, our position, and it changes the destiny of our understanding of where we are in the universe. Again, this idea of putting Darwin in with Huxley and Tyndale uh, and Spencer, um, uh, making it very clear that, you know, blasphemy is a crime that hurts no one. I'll leave you this last quote on George Foote. Oh, here. So this was written in his book, um, uh, Darwin on God. Uh, and then Chapman Cohn, who lived through World War I, World War II, all the way up through the 1950s, was a British uh, humanist and social thinker. Some of you may know uh, he was a, a very much uh, uh, really uh, uh, impressive in his own right, but someone who really did see Darwin's work as being seminal to the humanist and non-belief and, and the secular movement. And here are just some quotes. So now we get to the part of the presentation where I say, and, and if, any of it, and if anyone is either going for a PhD or is thinking about a PhD, what will always come back to you when you're writing your thesis is, why does this matter? You know, why should we hold Darwin in such esteem? Why is Wallace's work uh, on equal footing with Darwin? And why should we hold him in equal esteem um, for um, the, 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 the work that was done in order to heighten our ideas of humanity's place in nature? Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons. Um, in the United States, the people, number of people who accept the idea um, that the world is natural um, is not as great as it should be when you compare other nations. Um, you find uh, almost consistently that 
certainly a core one third, but another third might have doubts. Um, and uh, another third in the United States will not accept natural selection, i.e. reality for the sake of their beliefs in the spirit world or religion or some other reason. And you see, you know, one of the things that, you know, we always talk about the United States as being number one in many things, but in reality, you know, when education is dismantled and demoralized, it comes out in ways that makes us less competitive economically and as well as intellectually. And that certainly has an impact on the understanding of natural selection and science in general. These are um, somewhat older scores of the PISA average, but you see the United States is somewhere around, you know, 34th in mathematics, you know, 28th in reading, you know, 29th in science. And when you look at that, you can see that what danger that pr prevails um, in, a, in, a, in a nation that is founded on secular constitutional democracy when we are ignorant of science, when we are ignorant of mathematics, when we are ignorant uh, in terms of our reading skills that can only have outcomes that are negative. And frankly, we saw those things happen, you know, in the Capitol um, just a few years ago. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, a few, uh, a, a few, I wish it was a few years ago, just a few weeks ago. You know, uh, I'm, I'm surely uh, believe, uh, of, the, of the mindset, although I have not taken any census of the people who stormed the Capitol, but my idea is that probably not many, if any, had PhDs um, and probably not many were scientists. And then we've come to the people who are ruefully and interested to be remaining ignorant. Uh, you can go to Kentucky to the Creation Museum where just as we were talking about, you know, in the 16th century where uh, you're finally getting to the idea that the world is not just 70,000 years old. Well, you can go to the Creation Museum in Kentucky and see that the lie of is, is still alive, um, that um, there are displays in this quote unquote museum uh, where dinosaurs are with humans. Clearly that is based on philosophy and not science. And they built an ark park uh, to boost the idea of the world being 6,000 years old where nothing transitions um, uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, very, very dangerous. You know, I always say this to my students uh, when I'm teaching that what this really sort of teaches is the idea of Flintstone science. Um, that that this, is, this has more akin to Hanna-Barbera um, with the Flintstones as, than it, uh, than it, than it does as, as entertainment than it does as uh, reality. And this is always, of course, my favorite. Uh, this, uh, this isn't Gary Lawson, but it should have been, oh crap, was that today? <laughs> Hopefully you're chuckling at that. Uh, and today we have real dangers to the idea that the natural order of the world, uh, which is based on the material science, including Darwin's work in biology, but chemistry, physics, astronomy, um, so on and forth, so forth, is under attack. Um, you know, the, the people like to say the war on Christmas. Well, you know, you're seeing this alt-right war on science and now an alt-right attack on voting rights, where you have our former president, Mike Pence, who when he was in Congress, got on, you know, this is in the congressional record, spoke up and said, that the world is 6,000 years old and God created it all and evolution isn't true and um, um, that um, uh, Darwin's work is, well, he didn't actually mention Darwin, but the innuendo was is that there's a creationist mindset, there's a creationist reality, and that's what I accept. It was former 
um, uh, Senator Rick Sorrentorum, who tried to put in to the No Child Left Behind Act when George Bush was um, um, uh, president, a, uh, an amendment to the law that said that all states and all counties were free to teach as equal to biology in the classroom, the idea of, um, of uh, creationism. Um, and thank goodness that did not make it into the final bill's passing, but he put it in there. Uh, and then of course you have former members of the Trump um, uh, team uh, who uh, I would think um, uh, would not set foot um, uh, in uh, what would be thought of as being humanists under uh, any consideration or concern. So in summary, I'd like to add the following. You know, the importance of Darwin's work really tells us that ideas can change the world. Bring that forward in your own studies. Bring that forward in your own work. Uh, bring that forward, even if you're in the minority, you know, because you can change the world by understanding the material universe. In fact, it's almost a responsibility of all of us to want to do so. That all of us are connected to one big story in our one human family. Darwin's work proved that. Anything that is external to us, you know, our phenotype versus our genotype is just the accumulation of traits from our ancestors. The whole idea of race theory and phrenology and all these things are nothing but magical thinking. And as we've talked about earlier, uh, natural selection has, because it was eventually considered so fundamental and profound to not only biology, but to all sciences, have changed the world and changed science in a thousand different directions. So you should be that change as well. And I guess finally, we should be enlivened by this self-awareness. If it's one thing that humanism teaches us is that if we are part of material nature and then if we see ourselves as part of nature and not above nature, that not only we, can we build something together, all 8 billion of us, but then think of the imagination that we could take if we move away from fear and tribalism and the other and seek to explore our world and ourselves and then other worlds. That's a very Darwin point of view. That's a very scientific and humanistic point of view. So um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the presentation. Uh, I thank you for your time and attention. And if I've gone on too long, please accept my apologies. It's been great. Uh, I, I appreciate it. We've got a few questions that have already come through, and so I'll, I'll ask those. But I just wanted to start out, and uh, the New York Times a few days ago published sort of an article uh, entitled Darwin's Dim View of the Second Sex, and yes. talking about women. And I saw your response on social media, so I, I would love it if you could just start out by just sort of answering, sort of giving your, you know, your thoughts on that. Uh, sure. Sure. Um, so, as I mentioned uh, in, in the, the presentation, Darwin um, uh, believed and wrote uh, that women needed to be taken care of, that women might not be uh, or are not necessarily as smart as men. I think he came to it from the idea of, well, if we're going to keep our species going, then it depends on women being the caretakers. Uh, it was a very hunter-gatherer point of view, uh, a very um, a sexist point of view. Um, and I think Darwin was certainly on the wrong side of history with that. Um, uh, Darwin was anti-slavery, uh, but he was not uh, a very fair in his thinking. Putting him into context of the 19th century, well, 
you know, there were people who were Darwin's apostles who were already supporting um, um, the movement uh, for women's rights and equal rights. Uh, Darwin was just not really part of that. And we can't, you know, deny this. We, you know, Darwin doesn't have to be, Darwin should not be uh, put on a pedestal. He, his ideas should be respected. Um, his time should be respected. Um, and, and I do admire him for his work. I've been to Down House. I've spoken to um, uh, uh, relatives of Darwin, uh, not through seances or anything like that, but 21st century living people, descendants of Darwin, descendants of Wallace, descendants of Hooker. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I can tell you that, you know, as complex as, as we think our lives are now, our lot uh, in, the, in the 19th century lives were equally complex. Um, but, um, um, but, uh, but yeah, Darwin, Darwin didn't get that right. I appreciate that. So uh, one, of the, one of the questions we have is, uh, can you comment, it's from Mark, can you comment on religious and agnostic scientists, i.e. Ken Miller, Francis uh, Collins, Mike Ruse, who use the term neo-Darwinism as an attempt to negatively label uh, athe uh, atheist scientists like uh, Dawkins and Dennett, who dismiss the validity of theological evolution. Sure, I mean, um, you know, it was, um, uh, for those people who study science and who are scientists and, and who are also believers, I take nothing away from anybody who can, who can keep that, those two magisteria as, as Stephen Jay Gould would talk about them, in their heads as equal proportions. Um, uh, for me personally, um, you know, I am definitely on in, in the camp of, of, of Dawkins and Dennett uh, because I, I see the need for religious faith as superfluous to the needs of a common humanity. Um, I, I, while, while, you know, People who, um, like uh, Francis Collins, who is a believer and head of the National Science Foundation and has all these responsibilities, uh, can keep that bifurcation in their heads. Um, I'm not one to be bifurcated in this way. And I don't think I'm closed-minded. And I don't think, uh, I think neo-Darwinism is an unfair term because it's not closed-minded to see the world without needing magic to lead a good, happy, just life. And those people who are um, non-believers, who are also scientists, you know, um, accept the world as it is. Um, and I think that's really, really important because if not us, who? And the reality is, is that um, Darwin was criticized uh, as well by the religious um, and uh, by people who would not accept his theory. Um, um, and he lived with it. So, you know, in my mind, there's no real great debate here, just like there's no real great debate that creationism is equal to, or intelligent design is equal to our understanding of modern biology. Um, the, the, the fossil evidence and the genetic evidence not only shows our ancestry, uh, but explains and explores the world much more elegantly and um, infinitely than the belief in a particular Judeo-Christian God um, or some form of spirituality, um, which it, none of those things make the, the idea of natural selection better. You know, there's no talk about God <laughs> in, in, in these works, nor should there be, because we live in a material universe that doesn't require them. So I hope that helps. Sure. No, thank you. Uh, Charles asks, he says, you mentioned Darwin's work inspiring and changing other fields of thought, such as art and uh, education, but you mm -hmm. also said that his works were only meant to concern biology. So do you, cons do you consider that... Uh, 
uh, his, his expiring changes in other fields were misinterpretations or abuses of his work, or is, are some of them legitimate? Well, I think that uh, art is always in the mind of the beholder, where what I meant to say, and I apologize if I was confused, if I confused anyone, that Darwin's work should not be misinterpreted as having meaning as to uh, social Darwinism. That is the idea that somehow societies act as biological organisms. They do not. Um, uh, and so the idea of social Darwinism, which is the idea that, oh, you know, quote unquote survival of the fittest means that if you're the best, most aggressive society, you, you know, you're going to win and you should all bow down and stuff like that. And then they say, well, that's Darwin's way of thinking. Darwin never wrote about society. He was not a sociologist. He was essentially a biologist. Um, now, it, for things like um, um, uh, the you know, material sciences, um, uh, cosmology, uh, pharmacology, you know, you can't get away from the ideas of extinction and speciation and adaptation, um, with, which are all part of Darwin's work. Um, and uh, so that's, that's really important. As for, you know, how people may practice their understanding of Darwin versus what Darwin meant are different things. But if people are excited and inspired by Darwin's work, in let's say the arts or literature, which there is, there's a whole literature of people who are inspired by Darwin's work. Um, you know, Gene Roddenberry, you know, of Star Trek fame was inspired by Darwin's work. Um, uh, and, and, and so many other people um, that, you know, when, you when it comes to art, you know, that reflection is really a reflection of the artist and his or her times. Great, I have a, a question from Levi. He starts out, he says, I abandoned Christianity after accepting, accepting the evidence and evolution and recognizing its incompatible, uh, incompatibility with science. Mm -hmm. So do you have any thoughts on what it will take Islam to move in this direction? Or do we, are we seeing a movement within the faith uh, towards science? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, uh, up until about a thousand years ago, uh, you know, when Europe was in the in its dark ages, uh, Islamic thinkers and Islamic mathematicians kept math and science alive. Um, so there's always been this movement. Uh, I will not call it biologic, but I'll call it organic between societies and cultures. Um, if you look at the data. Right. So rather than give my opinion, I'll give you my, my idea of the data. If you look at what's happening with people who are much younger than uh, I am, you know, the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S versus N-U-N-S. Um, uh, you see that there's this incredible movement away from religious thinking. It may not necessarily be spiritual thinking, you know, I can be inspired and look at the stars and feel a spiritual connection to the universe. That doesn't mean it's a religious connection. So people have moved away from religion, um, uh, organized religion, um, uh, pretty quickly. Most churches, synagogues, um, even some um, um, mosques are empty on holy days um, uh, during the week and only see participation during spikes during particular times, whether it be, you know, Easter or Rosh Hashanah or, you know, um, uh, Eid or something like that. Um, certainly in secular societies, like in the United States, where you have that freedom to believe what you wish uh, or accept what you wish via conclusion, uh, that certainly secular democracy is the antidote to religious-based thinking uh, as, as much as science. In fact, they go together. You can't have healthy science without having healthy secular democracy. So I think in the Islamic world that 
those nations that become more secular will become more uh, less religious. Now you look at Turkey, which uh, for uh, many years uh, was a very secular country and has turned to become more Islamist. But then you uh, look at um, other uh, countries and you see that might be less so. Certainly, if you come to America, e even though the, your, the religion of your parents and the rituals of your parents, they may, they may be ascribed to you, you might lead a different life. In fact, I know many people in many different faith communities, uh, Islam included, who when the doors were closed, understand that it's not real uh, and go along with it because they can't break out of their family's tradition. So, um, so you know, what we can do as secularists, as humanists, as people who accept secular democracy um, is be welcoming to people. You know, the, you know, the more you are open to the experience of um, shedding biases and accepting um, uh, people from different cultures, um, the stronger the bonds of our common humanity grow. Uh, and that helps people leave religion behind because if you lead by example, um, you lead in a thousand different directions. You launch a thousand ships of goodness by doing that. I hope that helps. And Dana asks, is it, do you feel that scientists who have embraced religion have compromised their research, even if unwittingly? Um, you know, um, it, it, it depends. Um, like I said, I, I'm not one to accept a theological viewpoint of the world for those people who are religious and are doing science. If it, It's hard not to worry about the corruption that may be caused. But if you live an evidence-based life and you look at the research and if the research holds up, then I guess you can just uh, not have to have that fear, but always be cognizant that just like all research, right, whether it's religious-based or not, if there are scientists who fudge their numbers, not based on a religious view, but because they want to get tenure, I've seen that happen more than people dealing with religion. You got to worry more about that, or people who want to make a name for themselves, and they publish too early, or they mess with their data. You know, that I think is, is more of a problem. But that doesn't mean that we can't also include in that the idea that if someone is so religious that, you know, if they, if, if they use their religion to alter their data, then they're no longer doing science and they should not be respected for doing so. Great. If you're okay, we have one a little more serious question than one softball. Okay. Sure. So uh, Amy asks, and this is, I think, going back to a little bit what I sort of started, started the question and answer with, um, do you think that Darwin's disregard of women might have impaired him in that women and men are different as in brain function? Um, could this scientific thinking be the reason, in scientific in quotes, be the reason that women have not historically been involved in clinical testing? Wow. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a, a, a pretty deep question. Um, you know, um, I, I don't think we can blame Darwin for all of patriarchy's ills. Um, uh, certainly he did not contribute to the modern world in which in, in that case, uh, as he should have, uh, maybe um, uh, as I believe he should have. Um, um, but, you know, uh, it's such a complex issue. Uh, you know, one of the things that I find, and this was the case in academia, outside of Darwin, is that, you know, for generations, it's been an old boys club. It's been white guys from Europe running the show. And that's really been something that we have to not only be aware of, 
and understand the dangers of that, but also give credit to the people who I said earlier on in, in the first slide who have made such significant contributions to science, to social science, to, um, to our lives um, uh, when they don't look like me, you know, uh, or, or they're a different gender, whatever they feel their gender is. Um, that, that I dream of a world where that, that need to classify someone as tribally the other and ascribe to them faults, which are just nothing more than biases, becomes part of our history. That it winds up in a museum one day where a hundred years from now or 50 years from now, children will go back and look and say, we really thought that uh, because it's gonna be as earth shattering to an idea as the idea that women shouldn't have a right to their reproductive freedom, which we're still fighting now in this country and in other countries, that, that equality uh, does not belong to each and every one of us. Uh, so, you know, I am a humanist, I'm an optimist, I'm a, ra I, I'm, I'm a uh, rational in my optimism though, uh, but I'm also an activist, uh, formerly working at the United Nations um, for human rights and women's rights and the right for non-believers to speak and think freely. Um, so all those things are deeply important to me. And I may not have fully answered your question, but um, uh, I, I do think that Darwin was part of the problem in that sense. Yeah. Not part of the solution. Uh, they, I, I really sort of appreciate how you've sort of taken your most of your answers and really the point of your whole presentation and looking at so starting with Darwin and evolution and bringing it really to that humanistic free thought value. So you've continued. I really love how you've continued to do that. I don't I'm not saying you're doing it intentionally, but how you've done that with all of your answers. So that's great. So, so here's your softball. So Levi asks, he says, what's the best book on secularism that you have read most recently? Well, you know, there are so many. Um, that are um, that you can come come from this issue of secularism from a million different views from um, um, uh, you know uh, uh, Rob Boston I think uh, uh, wrote a, an excellent book about uh, the law and secularism and humanism uh, this is by Philip Kitcher this is called Life After Faith um, the case for secular humanism so. Um, uh, it's a personal uh, um, uh, book, but it's also a very uh, good book. So uh, I'm, I, I don't know this person, but I've liked the book. So I would recommend that to you. Um, I'm working on a new book now called The Accidental Species, which focuses, and that title may change. Um, you see a couple of hominids right back there, um, but I'm writing a new book. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, human empathy and human violence. Um, and uh, I've got uh, several people uh, writing uh, portions of it. I'm editing the book and it covers everything from law and justice, education, art, um, uh, the history of violence, and even like a humanity 2.0. So there's a lot going on. So hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll like that book because I think it has a lot of humanistic and secular value and uh, look for it in um, uh, next year. Great. Well, and I think it's interesting that we're sort of having this conversation sort of after 2020, right. um, where, and especially right now, where on the new, I mean, newscasters and scientists and, and doctors and everyone sort of giving us sort of the, uh, a, a quick time live view of evolution with the coronavirus yeah, that's right. um, and the variants and the mutations. And it's, it's almost, you know, science class every day. The I'm moment told. someone mentions variant, you go back to Darwin, speciation, adaptation, extinction. There you go. Exactly. Yep. So I really appreciate your time today. Um, one, I think you give, you give a, 
so much of your time and dedication to not, not only with lectures and your knowledge, but also your time and your leadership within the executive committees. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and also thank you for, you know, as a faculty member and working with students, clearly that's a passion of ours. Um, and we know that our students really appreciate it. So thank you for that as well. Well, it's my pleasure. And, and let me just add uh, to the students out there and who may watch this in the future, uh, you have a friend. Look me up on Facebook, send me an email. Uh, if I can help you in any way, um, you know, I was very fortunate to have one or two professors who really helped me become the person who I am right now. And if you don't have that in your life right now uh, and you're looking for it, um, don't be afraid to, to ring me up or uh, email me because I'm happy to uh, mentor uh, at, at any time and at any moment. Great. Thank you so much for everything today. Sure. You've given us a, a lot of good time. Thank you for hanging with us and I, you know, answering those questions. So I really appreciate it. Sure. Have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye.